All right, brethren. <clears throat> Today, I want to talk about something from Scripture as I give you a kind of a a Bible studies type of a sermon today, and I think you'll, you'll find this interesting. I hope you do. But first of all, I'll start out with saying, what are we looking for in, in this life? We're looking for a kingdom to come. That's what we're looking for. We're, our eyes are on a kingdom that is not yet here. It is not seen. Our hope is in the return of Christ to earth. And we commit our lives completely to prepare ourselves now for that event when he comes and we begin to reign with him. He, we know from the scriptures, we know he has also told us and when he was here in person that he is coming to reign. He is coming to rule. The first time he came as a sacrifice, the second time to rule. And that rule will be in righteousness with equity as re referenced in the sermonette uh, Isaiah chapter 11, talking about the rule of Jesus Christ. But he will also rule with a rod of iron. He's coming to rule with a rod of iron. And the nations of this world today that we see are going to be put down in their rebellion against God. Today we see, as John the Apostle writes in his epistle, the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. And that deception is going to culminate in a worldwide, world-ruling government that will rise in the last days that we are in now, very, very close to that time. And the, the seeds are out there planted, the rise of a world-ruling government that the scripture calls the beast power. We see that in Revelation. And the man of sin, as Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he talks about the man of sin to be revealed, who is that, that world ruling uh, government head, the man of sin, who, as it says in the 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and all that is worshipped. The Bible reveals these things to us. This is what the Bible is telling us is coming. It also describes the power behind the throne, if you will, of this final world ruling government. It describes an idolatrous system of religion, which God in the book of Revelation likens to a harlot, a harlot as the power behind the throne. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 17 and take a quick look here. Revelation chapter 17, it says, all of the inhabitants of the world will be drunk with the wine of her fornication, as we read here in Revelation 17 and verse one. The seven angels, as we break into the story of Revelation, who had the seven bowls came and talked to me, saying, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters is telling us that God is going to judge that harlot who sits on many waters. And what are those many waters? Well, verse 15 right there explains the waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The whole world will be part of this system, the whole world. And with the kings of the earth, verse two, it says, she has committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth are drunk with the wine of her fornication. This worldwide system of commerce and trade that, is, that man will try to perpetuate. Well, man will try to rule and govern the, the whole earth, but we know what's coming. So he carried me away, verse 3 continues, in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So it's describing this great harlot. In the last days, this is what scripture reveals is coming. An idolatrous worldwide system of government that merchandises and enslaves its people. It is a global system of commerce with great war-making potential. 
that receives its strength from a system of false worship. This is what scripture reveals to us is coming. And God calls this idolatrous worldly system of belief and religion a wicked harlot. A harlot. And when we put together the word of God, when we look at the whole word of God, we can find meaning in it. Who is this harlot? Who is she? Who is this person? When we look into scripture, as we will do today in this message, there is no person that better fits this description than Jezebel. The character of Jezebel in scripture fits this description of this harlot very well. And that's what I'm going to propose to you today. Let's put the scripture together. Here's a painting that was done in 1896 of Jezebel, famous painting. We know this person from the book of Kings, book, the books of Kings, and also in Revelation chapter two, we see her mentioned. God condemns her, Jesus Christ, when he's speaking to his church in Revelation chapter two, speaking of this harlot, he calls her that woman Jezebel. And that's the title of the sermon. We're gonna talk about that woman Jezebel today because her name today in our, in our world today, you don't find many people named Jezebel. <laughs> many people don't take that name. And there's a reason for that because she is associated with shameless, a, a woman of shameless um, morals. Well, who is she? That's what we're gonna look at today. This historical figure who was an idolatrous and impudent queen the wife of King Ahab, the king of Israel. She hated God, as the scripture shows, and she killed his prophets. And we'll look at the parallels between this Jezebel and the Jezebel of Revelation. Her character fits perfectly with the great harlot who sits on the many waters, who is sitting on that scarlet beast. We're gonna look at her today and learn the lessons from her story. The biblical character of Jezebel, who is the perfect type of the great whore of Revelation. As we go to look at her history, we, we need to go to 1 Kings, so come over there with, to me with, to 1 Kings, and this is where we're going to find her story as we go through it today. And then we'll come into the book of Revelation and look at her story in Revelation chapter two and then tie it all in with the woman who rides the beast. Jezebel's historical character, who, who is she? Well, it is what we're going to find out. She's in love with worldly things and she's completely given over to idolatrous worldly worship, the worship of Baal. And God destroyed her. In the end, the story, as we read in Kings, God destroyed her. And she met rather a, a rather, really a gruesome end. She was eaten by dogs. And God, in Revelation, will destroy the woman who rides the beast with all of her evil and idolatrous practices. So let's start here in 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16, this is the historical Jezebel from the scriptures. In verse 29, we'll read beginning in verse 29 of 1 Kings 16. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. So there we have the historical setting, where we are in, in time. Ahab's father, as it says, is King Omri. This was then about 60 years after the division of Israel into two kingdoms, in the, to the kingdom of Judah in the south and the kingdom of Israel in the north. And in the northern kingdom of Israel, there had been since that division, 
uh, that began with King Jeroboam. There had been a succession of kings, all of them wicked, because starting with Jeroboam, as we know the story, he changed the holy days of God. He started the people keeping different holy days, and therefore, from the beginning, the whole nation had that stain on it and continued to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. And now verse 30 says about Ahab, the son of Omri, he did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him, all the other kings who were before him. And verse 31, it came to pass as though that had been a trivial thing. If that wasn't small enough for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, even greater than that, as the the scripture is trying to get across from us, even worse than that, he took as his wife Jezebel of the daughters of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshiped him. So he married a foreign wife and began worshiping her God. And such an introduction as we find here in scripture proves from the beginning that Jezebel is thoroughly wicked. And Ahab's marriage to her helped solidify the economic ties that Israel had with Phoenicia. So I have a map here. Take a look at this map. Israel and Phoenicia. As you see, Phoenicia's in the upper, upper right of the northern kingdom of Israel. And you see up there labeled the, the merchant city of Sidon. And below that, by like t- about 25 miles to the south, is Tyre. So we have those two cities, Sidon and its sister city, Tyre. Sidon, of which Jezebel, as it says here in verse 31, she was the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. So she operated in this area, in Phoenicia. Sidon is an important city in Phoenicia. It's a seagoing city, along with Tyre. With its seagoing trade, they influenced Israel to drift away from God. What did they bring? They brought the world because they were seagoing. And they could go and trade with all the other nations of of the world in a merchandising system. And this is from which Jezebel comes. She supported this. And she was a, 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 a she, she helped Ahab continue in this merchandising type of a system. Also introducing Baal worship. So therefore, these two cities, Tyre and Sidon, were instrumental in Israel's drift away from God. And Jezebel, as the Sidonian princess, promotes this worldly merchandising system. Numerous times in the scripture, we see that God pronounces judgment on Tyre and Sidon through his prophets. If you come with me to Ezekiel 28 for a moment. Numerous times in the scriptures, not just where we're going here in Ezekiel 28, but numerous times God is pronouncing judgment on Tyre and Sidon through his prophets. And some of those judgments, as we read them in the scripture, did come to pass when the, the, uh, the kingdom of Babylon overtook this area of the world. Some of those judgments did come to pass, but many of them are clearly for a time yet future. As you would turn with me then to Ezekiel 28 and take a look at a couple of these uh, judgments against uh, Sidon. But note this as soon as I get there in Ezekiel 28. You've read this before, I'm sure. What is this talking about? The king of Tyre. The king of Tyre. Moreover, verse 11 now of Ezekiel 28, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty, and you were in Eden, the garden of God. Who's this talking about? It's talking about 
Satan the devil, the king of Tyre. There's something very symbolic about Jezebel's relationship with Sidon and Tyre. Those two cities, very influential in Israel's drift away from God and very influential in the introduction of Baal worship into the country. And now you start seeing the similarities between the woman of Revelation, the, the one who rides the beast, the power behind the throne, if you will, and Jezebel. Let's continue a few more verses here. Verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, etc. And then verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. There's none other than Lucifer. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. Talking about the king of Tyre. This is for the future, brethren. This is a prophecy for the future showing us that the king of Tyre, which is a merchandising city, along with Sidon, is influencing Israel, the people that God has chosen. The same things are playing out in the book of Revelation. When we look forward into the future and we see what's going to happen, the entire world will be deceived and pulled away by a false religious system that supports the, the king who is the man of sin. And we know who this is, brethren. So when we start putting the pieces together, the types start to fit. So let's go back then to the story in 1 Kings. We're going to keep going there in 1 Kings 16. And then Ahab, <clears throat> as he was seduced by his wife to do so, he sets up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Where is Samaria? Well, that is the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. Samaria is the capital city. And now, instead of a temple to God, there's a temple to Baal. Well, how we could see why Jezebel was so wicked. From the beginning, she influenced this development. And Ahab made a wooden image, as it's continuing in verse 33. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And now, as the story goes through kings, what happens? Because of all the evil that is now in the land, God sends prophets to turn them away. And this is where we see the introduction of Elijah. Elijah first appears in the scriptures here in 1 Kings chapter 17. And he pronounces a drought, a drought that is going to last for three years. And through that three years, God protects Elijah, as we know the story. God protects Elijah by sending him to the city of Zarephah in the region of Sidon. So he basically goes into, if you will, the belly of of the beast. And there he is protected for three years, Elijah. It's very interesting also if we tie in more of the story here that Jesus Christ ep mentions this episode in Luke chapter 4 when he went into the synagogue of Nazareth. Jesus Christ at the beginning of his ministry goes into the synagogue of Nazareth and mentions this story of Elijah going into this widow in the city of Zarephah. And the, the people rose up in his, in his city of Nazareth and attempted to kill him. But we know the story, he escaped them at that time. So there's many connections between the biblical history, the story of the biblical history and the way things are going to play out in the future. So meanwhile, as this drought is going on, it's just go, going through the story here in 1 Kings, Ahab conducts a search for Elijah. He conducts a, a search, looks everywhere for him, 
and his wife Jezebel at that time then sets out to kill all the prophets of God. She kills God's people. The woman in Revelation has the blood of the saints on her hands. Another parallel that we can see between these two personage, personages. So 1 Kings then, 18, we're now in chapter 18 of 1 Kings, verse 3. Just going through the story, putting the pieces together. For it was while Jessica, Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them, 50 to a cave, and fed them with bread and water. So Jezebel is a God-hater. She hates God's people, and she kills them. But then God sends Elijah to confront Ahab to his face, and the prophet challenges Ahab to see whether God will honor the, the God of Elijah or the God Baal. And we know where this is going. This is going to Elijah's great victory at Mount Carmel. There's a photo of a statue of Elijah on Mount Carmel. And if you've been there, first thing you see when you get up to the place where we don't know exactly where the, the slaughter of the prophets of Baal took place, but it, it's, this is on Mount Carmel, where you see this statue of Elijah. This confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal is a stunning victory. We know it well, where he tells all the prophets of Baal to sacrifice, make a sacrifice, and call on their God. And if whichever God consumes the sacrifice, that is the true God, as, as the story goes. Let's look at it in 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18, and just read, read through it quickly here. In verse 21, he says, <clears throat> Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, and if, but if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. And then verse 23, and therefore let them give us two bowls and let them choose one bowl for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bowl. I will lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it because we will call on our God who will consume that sacrifice. And verse 26, and so they cried aloud, the prophets of Baal cried aloud and cut themselves as, with their, as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out upon them as they were calling on their God. And Elijah mocked them. In verse 30, and then Elijah said to the prophets, said to the people, come near to me after all of this display and nothing happened for the prophets of Baal. He said, come near to me. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And he took the 12 stones. And then verse 32, he built this, an altar with those stones in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around that altar enough to hold two seas, a seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bowl in pieces, laid it on the wood and said, fill four water pots with water. So he had four water pots of water. And he said, do it again. Throw another four water pots of water and do it again until the whole sacrifice was drenched and the trench around it was filled with water. And then he calls upon the name of the Lord. And this is very dramatic. This is verse 33, 37 says, hear me, hear me, O Lord, verse 37, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And then verse 38, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then we know what happened next. Elijah orders all 400 
50 prophets of Baal to be killed. And he kills them there. It's a dramatic victory. It's a great victory for God. And a great victory showing who is the true God. But the response that we see from Jezebel to this great victory is bone chilling, bone chilling. Verse one of the next chapter, chapter 19 of 1 Kings, verse one, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with the sword and then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods to do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the, the life of one of them by tomorrow morning at this time. In other words, I am going to find you and I am going to kill you. That was her response to this great dramatic miracle that showed who is the true God. And then we know what happened next. Elijah runs for his life. He runs out of the country, escaping south into Judah, which is another nation at this time. And after this, God allows Elijah to continue for some years, or Ahab to continue as king for some years while he's keeping Elijah safe from the wicked Jezebel. But next in the, script, in the story of Jezebel, we're going to go into 1 Kings 21 now. 1 Kings 21, when Ahab, the king, there at his palace in Samaria, desired a vineyard that was next to the palace. Ahab desires the vineyard of Naboth. And this shows, again, the moral depravity of Jezebel. So verse, verse 3 of 1 Kings 21, story of Naboth's vineyard that Ahab desired. Naboth, verse three, said to Ahab, the Lord, Ahab asked to buy it, but his response, Naboth's response, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. This piece of land, which had been given to his fathers and passed through the generations. When Israel first came into the land, the land was allotted, and his fathers received this portion of the land. It was passed down through the generations, and God had always said the land was not to be sold permanently. It was always to revert to the owners. If he sold it, he would lose it. He would, it would be out of his possession and probably would never get it back. And so at the rebuff of Naboth, Ahab is sad. He goes in and his wife Jezebel notices this. Verse, verse five, First Kings 21. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? And he said to her, why? He said, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite, and I said to him, give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Well, no one is going to tell Jezebel what to do. And she's going to get that vineyard. And so he, she says to him, verse 7, you now exercise authority over Israel. You're the king. Arise and eat food and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So with evil intent, Jezebel goes to plot a cold-blooded murder. The murder of Naboth shows you another side of her character, another, another dimension of her character, what lengths or depths of depravity she will go to. So verse 9 says she wrote letters in letters saying, proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honors among the people. So he, she plotted this scheme. And seat two men, scoundrels, verse 10, 
before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed the God and the king. You have blasphemed God and the king. Take him out and stone him that he may die. And she feels not a bit of compassion, not a bit of shame that she will have innocent blood on her hands. And so it came to pass, verse 15, when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezreel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. Remember the character traits of the woman, the wicked whore of Revelation, who is the power behind the throne, who has, like Jezebel, the blood of innocence on her hands, blood of the innocents on her hands. So after Naboth's murder, God sends Elijah to confront Ahab again and prophesy to Ahab how he was going to die and how Jezebel was going to die. So this is in now 1 Kings 21. 1 Kings 21, and we're still there in verse 18. Verse 18, 1 Kings 21, Arise and go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria, God tells Elijah. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And he had. He had spilled innocent blood. He was complicit in the plot. And you shall speak to him, saying, You shall speak to Ahab, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, yours also. Pronounces this judgment against him. And so Ahab says to Elijah, Have you found me, O enemy? And he answered, I have found you because you sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Sold out to evil. Sold out to wickedness. And that evil did not escape God's eyes. And God pronounced then the judgment on Ahab's house to cut him off from Israel. All of his descendants would be cut off. And concerning Jezebel, as he continues this prophecy of their deaths for this wickedness, and concerning Jezebel, verse 23, the Lord spoke also, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat Jezebel. She would come to a gruesome end. And there, verse 25 says, There was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, had stirred him up. She was the power behind the throne, just as we will see in the end times. The woman in scarlet who rides the beast who is the power behind the throne, who has the blood of innocent people on her hands, who promotes a, a worldwide merchandising system in type very much like Jezebel. Ahab then, as the story continues though, he repents. He repents of his wickedness in fasting and sackcloth as the scripture continues. And it was then that God decided to delay the, the cutting off of his lineage until after his death. So he would slaughter, have his sons slaughtered, have his sons wiped out. But Ahab himself would die. He would die in battle. And the dogs, as we see in the scripture, the story continues, would lick his blood. And as, as we go along, we come to Jezebel's death. To do that after the death of Ahab, 
God raised up a destroyer. His name was Jehu. So we have to turn now to 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. And we see the story of Jezebel's death. Just as it was prophesied. In 2 Kings 9. And starting there in verse 30. And now when Jehu, who had been raised up by God to wipe out the family of Ahab, Jehu came to Jezreel, and Jezebel heard it, and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head after Jehu had already killed Ahab's descendants. And then as Jehu entered the gate, she said, is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? And he looked at the window, Jehu looked up at the window where she was and said, who is on my side, who? And so two or three eunuchs looked out at them and then he said, throw her down. And so they threw her down and some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses and he trampled her underfoot, a gruesome end for Jezebel. But she was impudent right until the end. She painted her face and looked out the window, showing that she didn't think she was deserving of this. And so they went to bury her. uh, And when they had gone in, as it says in verse 34, Jehu went in and ate and drank after Jezebel's death. And then he said, go now and see to this accused woman to bury her, for she was a king's daughter. But they went and looked for her, but they found none of her, but the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. There was nothing left but her skull and feet and hands. What a gruesome end. And therefore, verse 36, they came back and told him, saying, and he said, this is the word of the Lord which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, on this plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. That's exactly what happened. And the corpse of Jezebel, verse 37, shall be as refuse on the field in the pot at Jezreel, so shall they not be able to say, here lies Jezreel, because there's nothing left. When God destroys the woman who rides the beast, there will be nothing left. And so there's another fitting parallel we could look at and say, there's nothing left of this wicked Jezebel. And there will be nothing left of this wicked harlot who is the power behind the beast. Just as the Jezebel of kings meets her gruesome death, the Jezebel a revelation meets a despicable end. So now let's come to the New Testament in chapter two. We're going to go to Revelation chapter two. Uh, <clears throat> revelation chapter two, where we see Jezebel mentioned again in the scriptures. And this, of course, is the letter one of the seven letters that Jesus Christ gave to the apostle John to give to the seven churches, as we call the seven churches of Revelation, and these letters spoken by Christ in Revelation chapter two and three. And so when he comes to the church of Thyatira, this is what he says, verse 20 of Revelation two, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith and your patience, And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So very complimentary of these Christians who were enduring and doing good works. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I have this photo of Thyatira today. If you go there, we did on our tour of the seven churches, there's not much of the ancient city left. 
And if, as I was standing there taking this photo, right behind me was a busy boulevard, and I think I remember a drugstore across the street. But this section of the ancient city is still there. And we can't tell with certainty when we look at this letter to Jesus Christ, to the church in Thyatira, if this Jezebel was a literal person or not. More than likely, Jezebel was not a real person, but in the spirit of Jezebel was embodied in a person or persons who were operating in the church or were uh, among the church at Thyatira. Christ in this letter describes how persuasive she is in the church. She uses her self-appointed position to lead the church members to sin. What we do know historically about Thyatira is that it was also highly commercialized. There was a lot of merchandising going on in the city of Thyatira, and there were multiple trade guilds that were extant in that city of that time. Trade guilds like the union halls, if you will. And each of those trade guilds had their own god, their own god. And those who were members of the guild, if they wanted to work in that trade, would have to somehow uh, pay allegiance or acknowledge the god of that trade guild. This is from history that we know. And so it appears from reading the letter to the church in Thyatira that some brethren were compromising with their faith by being members, perhaps, of these guilds in order to work, in order to have a job, in order to, to be accepted in the world or to be a part of the world. This is what it appears to be saying. Again, we don't know if Jezebel here in Revelation chapter two is an historical person, but certainly we can say there was a corrupting influence like Jezebel drawing members of the church into the world. The same thing that the Jezebel of history did to Israel drew them into the world, the attraction being the commerce and the trade of Phoenicia, the seagoing trade, also introducing or influencing Israel to worship a foreign god. Those influences we see infiltrating the church at Thyatira. The woman was like, the woman of Revelation chapter two is like the woman the Jezebel of the Old Testament, who influenced the people of Israel to corrupt themselves. That's exactly what the woman of Revelation chapter two is doing. Well, what does God say about friendship with the world? And this is a lesson we all must always keep in our minds because we are living in this world, but we are not to be a part of this world. James the Apostle writes, we know this very well, James 4, verse 4, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? If you will be a friend of the world, you will be an enemy of God. Whoever, therefore, James writes, James 4, 4, wants to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's what Jezebel in Thyatira, or the spirit, if you will, of Jezebel was doing. Christ's charge in Revelation, his charge against Jezebel continues in Revelation 2, verse 21. Verse 21 of Revelation 2. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. And this is like the impudent Jezebel of the scriptures we read about in First and Second Kings. She did not repent. She was given time to change. Ahab repented, but Jezebel did not. And she remained defiant 
the Jezebel of history, to her very end, painting her face to the very end. And Christ pronounces his judgment on her. Therefore, he says, verse 23 of Revelation 2, I will kill her children with death. That's an interesting way to say, I will, I will end somebody's life, but you, she will, he will kill her with death. It's as if describing two deaths, a physical death and a second death. I will kill her children with death. This will be a second death of those who will be the children of Jezebel, the children of a false religious system at this time in Revelation, and the children of a false religious system that will influence the whole world in the time of the end. This is the dire warning to us that we cannot compromise with the world. God wants us to be separate from it. As he said, I will kill her children with death and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. So he looks at us and looks in our heart to see that we are not allegiant to anything of this world, but only to him and to God. And I will give to each of you according, as he says, as he continues in verse 23, according to your works. Anything less than complete allegiance to God and friendship with the world is, in his eyes, idolatry. That is the warning we can take from this lesson of Jezebel in Revelation chapter 2. And God will purge that sin from his people. So now let's look at the prophetic implications again. Here's that painting again of Jezebel. We see, once again, in Jezebel's historical character, an impudent, unrepentant, God-hating woman who is the power behind the throne. She promoted Baal worship and persecuted the true servants of God. These things we will see in the time of the end. She was the power behind the throne in full support of an idolatrous, worldly, merchandising society. That's the Jezebel of history. When we look at the harlot of Revelation 17 and 18, that's what we see, a woman who promotes an idolatrous system of religion that supports a worldwide merchandising system. In the end time, this powerful, corrupt government will receive its strength, as scripture clearly shows, from a false religious system. It will persecute the saints of God who oppose it, just like Jezebel persecuted God's prophets. And the seductive wine of her fornication, if you will, is the riches that this system brings to the world. The kings of the earth, as we read in Revelation chapter 17. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 17. We read this earlier. Revelation chapter uh, 18, yeah, 17, verse 3, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And that is friendship with the world, friendship with all things in, with the world. And now, verse 18, the fall of Babylon, this end time world ruling government. For all nations, verse three, verse chapter 18 now, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, this evil, adulterous system of religion that God likens to a harlot. 
They have all drunk of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the, the abundance of her luxury. We see now, brethren, the world is more interconnected now financially than ever before. We can see the groundwork has been laid for a worldwide economic system to take hold, where if you want to participate and you want to have wealth and get wealth from it, you must give your allegiance to it. That's what we see coming. For all nations have drunk of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth, verse 3 continues, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And verse 4 then of Revelation 18, and I heard another voice saying, come out of her, my people. We cannot be part of it, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. When Jezebel had Naboth murdered, that did not escape God's attention. Jezebel murdered an innocent, innocent man. And her sin was not forgotten by God. He dealt with it and he destroyed her for it. Uh, and he destroyed her also for slaying his people, his prophets. As it says, verse five again, her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works and the cup which she has mixed, mix it double for her. Mix it double. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, the same measure give her torment and sorrow for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am no widow and I will not see sorrow. When we think about that, that verse right there, describing what she thinks of herself, we can liken that to Jezebel painting her face and looking out the window and saying, I am not a widow, even though her husband was dead, even though her sons had just been killed, and I will not see death. It fits, brethren. It fits very well. When we put the scriptures together and we look at it, the character is, is just perfect. Perfect. The Jezebel of Revelation, the Jezebel of the Old Testament fits with this idolatrous woman of Revelation 17. And she do, and, and now come, uh, now uh, then, let, let's come to, back to Revelation chapter two. Revelation chapter two, because this is still Christ's message to us concerning Jezebel and concerning what we must do to stay out of that system, out of that worldly system, which will deceive the whole world. Verse 24, back in Revelation chapter two. And I say to you, and the rest in Thyatira, as many as who do not have this doctrine, in other words, they are not given over to this idolatrous system. They're not going along with it. And I say to you, as many as who do not have this doctrine, who do not know the depths of Satan, as they say, that I will put no other burden on you, but, as it says in verse 25, hold fast until I come. And that's what we must do, brethren. Hold fast until he comes. Resist the world. Don't let it into our lives. Stay separate from it. And, verse 26, he who overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him I will give power over the nations, and he shall rule them, as Christ will rule with us. We will rule with him, with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I have received 
for my father, and I will give her, give him the morning star. The nations of this world, which now the kings of the earth and the nations of this world are drunk with the wine of the wrath of this great harlot. They will be put down and destroyed, and they will be ruled with a rod of iron being dashed to pieces. And Christ tells us here, as he tells all seven of the churches in verse 29, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen to this. Listen to what the Spirit is telling us. Understand what Christ is telling the church. Take the scripture and read it. Put it together and see what we need to watch out for as we continue to endure until the end. As he says, hold fast until, he, until I come. As he says concerning Jezebel here in Revelation 2, I will kill her children with death. Really, that is the second death. There will be no more Jezebel. She will meet a violent end because her sins have reached to heaven and God has not forgotten. This Jezebel in Revelation, the Jezebel, or I'm calling her the Jezebel, the harlot of Revelation of 17 and 18, they meet a violent end just like Jezebel of the Old Testament. So the main lesson for us today, brethren, is to take this story, internalize it, and never let us tolerate the seductive influences of that woman, Jezebel. 